Hello, welcome to Watching the Tudors. I'm Heather. I'm Jonathan. And this is the show where we watch the Tudors and break down all the history and the real truth behind the drama. So if you don't know me, I've been po- podcast. I almost said podcasting. Podcasting for almost 12 years on Tudor England with the Renaissance English History Podcast. And I'm Jonathan, and I've been married to her for like 15 years this year. I know. Yeah. So I've been podcasting on Tudor England almost as long as I've been married to you. Yeah. And I've been around someone who's been interested in Tudor history for that long and still haven't picked up um, very much of it. Right. So that's the point of the show. We watch the show. You ask me what was true, what wasn't true, because you don't know anything about this. Nope. Nope. Um, Okay, so if you do want to dive deeper into Tudor history behind, beyond the TV show, you can go to englandcast.com or you can subscribe to the Renaissance English History Podcast wherever you are listening to this show. And one other thing I want to say quickly, because I talk about it on my other show, but I've never talked about it here, which is TudorCon, which we do now. The next one's going to be October 2021. Yep. It's three days of talks by some leading Tudor bloggers and experts, um, historians, and we do it at a winery next to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair for three days, talks, lectures. And the idea is like in person. It's all in person. We've kind of forgotten about that idea. Right. Yeah. 2021, we're going to be in person again. And it's um, a chance to hang out with other Tudor history lovers. And it's kind of a mix. We have parties, we have fun events, but also learning. So I wanted to kind of do a mix of like something between an academic conference and a Renaissance fair. Because if you're like me, you remember we used to go to the Renaissance fair and I would get so snotty about stuff. I'd be like, why are they wearing kilts? Like England and Scotland hated each other. There's no, and like, what are, who are these goth people? Like, this is re- so historically inaccurate. Right. It would drive me nuts. But I and also. it would drive me nuts how much it drove me. Right. But I also love the Renaissance fair. So we have um, a party on Friday night with period entertainment and fun games, tutor games and stuff like that. You can come in costume. And then we have talks on Saturday and Sunday all day. We have entertainment on Saturday night. You can learn more. Oh, and the big thing why I'm saying this, oh, we have a feast on Sunday afternoon um, and with private entertainment, all that. And I only, I literally only have less than 15 tickets left. If so you have 13. I have 13. I might be able to add some more. I have to get permission from the fire marshal. But yeah, right now I only have 13 tickets left as of today. So it might, I might be able to open a few so more. So where can they find the tickets? They can find out more at englandcast.com slash TudorCon2021. E-N-G-L-A-N-D-C-A-S-T dot C-O-M. Englandcast.com slash TudorCon, T-U-D-O-R-C-O-N, 2021. Or you can Google TudorCon. I mean, you could do that too. Yeah. All so right. Should we get into so the So we are on season three, episode four the one in which Jane dies. So we had to stop watching because you started crying. Yeah, and I'm not going to make it through um, this whole uh, episode with you either. Right, so I'll just talk a little bit about Jane's childbirth and what was kind of portrayed differently and things like that. Um, I'll talk about that. You're already starting to cry. Jesus. (laughs) Oh my God. All right, let's do it. Let's Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Oh, hit me. All right, first question. We got this model boat for a coronation what's what's the deal with the coronation so boat? well okay so henry loved ships henry the eighth like built the tudor navy i think i've talked about this before i don't remember mm-hmm. um but he inherited something like seven boats from his father and even mm. his father had actually started to build up the tudor navy he built the dry docks at deptford um and so henry the eighth then inherited this very small navy he built it up he built these flagships like um, the Mary Rose, which was mm-hmm. lift, it was um, shot down, shot down. It was burned and, and sunk during uh, the French. Actually, did it during a battle off the Isle of Wight um, later on. And but the Mary Rose was found recently and brought up, and you can actually tour it. It's very cool. Um, and he built uh, a number of amazing flagships. So Henry was he was like a kid in a candy store when it came to like boats. It, yeah. There was a lot of I've done episodes on my other show about boats and the changing technology of boats of this time and ship. ships yes thank you boats and ships um and so anyway there were changes in like how the, the cannons were positioned in the mm-hmm. sides and and the the way the wood was put on anyway so henry really was into that he loved it 
it was like a kid in a candy store. So he loved boats. So the Bosun Tour was actually um, an Italian type of ship. It was called, it was owned by the Doges of Venice. And it was, you know, a ship that was like this. Every year they would take it out onto the Adriatic Sea to perform the marriage of the sea, which symbolically wedded Venice to the sea. Wow. They did that every year up until 1798. Sounds fancy. So I don't know that Henry actually ever had plans to do this for Jane's coronation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe this was just showing that at this point, he would have probably been thinking about Jane's coronation. Um, and he loved boats. So that's probably where that came from. That sounds it's cool. An, that's it's a, a chance to show some cool boats. It's a cool idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> and then next we are on to Reginald Pole. Oh, yes, uh, we are. I guess it was Cromwell telling the king about him. Yes. So he, so was all that accurate? He was made a, a bishop and, uh, and he can, he was wrote made a, a cardinal. Oh, a cardinal. Excuse yes. me. And then um, wrote a pamphlet. We talked about this last time because this okay. pamphlet was actually supposed to be just a letter to Henry, which uh, but then it got was out. made public. Yeah. And I don't know, there's like, he probably put it out on purpose, mm -hmm. um, but it was in the form of a letter to Henry yeah. that got out. Yeah. Wow. And so he really called him a heretic. Oh, yeah. He went hard. Yeah. That's I. Yeah. That's that's that takes some something. It also took something because Henry paid for his education. Yeah. No, I know. I know. That's like, yeah. And <laughs> Henry and all of his family was in England still. So they were like, he, it's easy to do this from the safety of Italy. Yeah. Like it takes absolutely nothing. Talk about like a wimp, like come tell it to me to my face. Yeah, right. Seriously. And so, and like do it, do all that while your family and his family is going to suffer for it. We'll yeah. see. Um, and it, it was like <clears throat> really, really, I, I think like I have so little respect for him for that. Yeah. Like be like, I don't know, like stand up. If you're going to say it, don't be a wimp and say it in a pamphlet sent from Italy. Yeah, from, from hundreds of miles. While your family is there. At least if you're going to do that, get your family out first, you know? That makes <laughs> like... sense. Yep. All right. Well, moving on to, to Ask. And poor Robert. Is poor Robert Ask. Robert yes. Ask. Yeah. And it, he, was, he was actually executed in York. He that... was. And <clears throat> I think you were going to ask me how many. He was, he was hung in chains like that, which yeah. was a, a common. Uh, a common way to punish the rebellious leaders. Later on, mm -hmm. under Edward VI, there was Ket's Rebellion, which is a fascinating rebellion. I'm, I'm really sorry this show only stops. Maybe we'll have, maybe there'll be a TV show about Edward's reign someday and we can talk about Ket's Rebellion. But the leader of Ket's Rebellion, Robert Ket, was also hanged in chains. Mm -hmm. it, it was a common way to hang leaders yeah. of rebellion like that. Fun. Absolutely. Mm. It's, it's so interesting, the, 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 the many uh, creative ways they have to kill people. Right? Yeah. You know, there's that museum in London. Um, the mm. There's like this torture museum that yeah. you can go to to yeah. see all the different... I remember walking past it. Yeah. Um, it was on that road where um, Jack the Ripper, I guess, is there? Maybe. There's a bunch. I, I think, I know, I think it's on the other side in Southwark. I don't know. I don't know. By okay. Waterloo Station or something? Yeah. I forget exactly. I'd have to look it up. All right. So, and then Brandon, <clears throat> Charles yes. Brandon, did he have one Wait, child? weren't you? Oh, yeah. You were going to ask me later. And yeah. yeah. So Charles Brandon, actually, he had a number of children. He was uh, quite active. He had children. With like different, different yeah. people. So the first thing was he had a child way early on with a woman. And then he married, he divorced that woman and married her aunt, I think, because she was like an heiress. And then he took all of her money and um, I don't know, whatever. So there's a book. Um, that Tony Riches wrote mm -hmm. called Charles Brandon Tudor Knight. And I interviewed Tony Riches about Charles Brandon. It, it's an interest, he's an interesting story and he can be um, quite, um, what's the word for when you kind of like someone? He can be likable. Charm charming? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Um, at, but any, and he had to have a certain level of charm to be able to survive mm -hmm. Henry for as long as he did. And also woo every woman Exactly. In sight, so he had a number of children, two of them, Henry and Charles. It was really sad. They died of the sweating sickness within hours of each other when they were older. Um, they were sent to, they were in college in Cambridge when they were older and their mother wanted to protect them when they heard that the sweat was coming and she sent them away and it was a, the wrong mistake. They wound up, even though they were sent to this house out in the countryside, they wound up getting it and they each died within hours of each other. It was like tragic. 
Um, and then Catherine Willoughby is a really interesting person later on. She married for love to like some guy who was like 30 years younger than her. Mm-hmm. He was like, it worked in her stables. And mm-hmm. anyway, that's Catherine Willoughby. She's a really interesting person. But yes, Charles Brandon had lots of children. Nice. All over the place. Yep. And then had, and then so Brandon was going off to sort of lead this, uh, Italian or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And had he fought before? Does he have fighting Yeah, he experience? had fought in France in the early wars that Henry VIII had against France. Like when... as a soldier? Would he, or yeah. Or maybe like no, he some was, sort of officer? Yeah, he was an officer okay. kind of person. He led, uh, he was especially, I think, at the Siege of Tournai, he was, and, um, and he, he had had experience with this, yeah. Okay. His father had been the standard bearer for Henry VII at the Battle of Bosworth. Hmm. That was how Charles Brandon, his father died, being generally standard bearers, died during a, a battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, his fa- and Henry VII had promised his father that he would look out for him, so then Charles Brandon was raised in the household, and that's how he met Henry. And they and got were to like be such kids good together and stuff. Charles Brandon was older than Henry by about 10 years, oh. but um, Henry apparently always looked up to him, saw him as, you know, he was about 10 years older, so Henry always kind of saw him as this, like, super cool guy yeah. and and looked up to him and stuff but um yeah so his father fought at bosworth and died and and charles would have been raised with that same kind of uh, ideas of military service yeah yeah huh. that's yeah. interesting and then this a standard bear would he have like a sign that basically said the king's here and he had the flag and he had all of like he was the one holding the the king's flag and he was right next to the king so everyone so everybody... basically aimed for him exactly Yep. Good stuff. Yep. And I bet he didn't have the, the best armor either. All right. Anyways. Um, okay. So Sir Ralph. Something. Elliker. Sir yeah. Ralph Elliker. Was, he, he was um, a, a, a rebellion type who, I guess, signed an agreement. Yeah. Is that, is that so accurate? I had to, I had like to look person, who yeah. he was. He is a person. And when you look him up, there's actually nothing really that talks about the pilgrimage of grace. On... He was involved in that. really. Yeah. But he was, he lived in Yorkshire. Um, and that's, he was, a. I think maybe they're taking him to be this kind of amalgamation of, of yeah. there were a number of people, including Catherine Parr's husband, Catherine Parr, who would later become Henry's sixth wife. Um, there were a number of people who were these landowners who were caught up in the rebellion because the rebels came to their house basically and said, we're going to kill your family unless you let us ah, use your house as like a staging point. So there were a number of these la- landowners and, and gentry and even high up people, lords who were supposed to be up there protecting the North because the relationship with the North was always kind of dicey because borders would change with Scotland and how loyal was the North and all of this kind of stuff. So the relationship was always kind of iffy. And so Henry had like his most trusted people. Usually there were these families like the Percy's and the Neville's that that was also in the Wars of the Roses, blah, blah, blah. I'm getting sidetracked. They were supposed to be up there protecting the North and they got caught up in the pilgrimage of grace. And they would, they said afterwards, look, it wasn't our fault. The rebels came and threatened us. And so we had to go along with it. And Henry's big job was trying to figure out like who actually <laughs> was against him and who just got caught up. Yeah, or... exactly. And so a lot of these people like Catherine Parr's husband said like they were believed kind of, but then mm. they were watched really carefully yeah. and stuff. Um, and, and so I think maybe Elliker's this, the way they brought him in is to be an example just of sort of used him as, what as that a is. Placeholder. For that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And then while they were reading like his agreement, you know, they said in, you know, by the decree of King Henry, King of England, and King of France, what, like, what's, what's the King of France bit about? Yeah, so he had an official title that had all of that, but the, that goes back to the Hundred Years' War when, and that's Henry, they never gave up their claim to that. Um, Henry the Fourth, I believe, is, no, Henry the Fifth is the one who, before, at the end of the, after the Battle of Agincourt, was all the way was the heir and was expected to be the king of France, but then like Joan of Arc, and this is where like I don't know the whole history of this, yeah. um, but I know that then the French were able to fight back, and then you have England gets all caught up in the Wars of the Roses in part because Henry the Sixth lost a bunch of land, like gave up 
had to forfeit all this. And by the time you get to Henry, there's still this claim. Like, yeah, it's look, still like, that should be my country. Right. But, and, and, and I'm going to let you have it for right now, kind of. And it's also <laughs> weird because, well, no, because he always, like, that was why he wanted to go to France. Like, even later on, like, that was why he wanted to go to France. Even later on in his, um, in, we'll see in the Tudors, right at the end of his life, he d- took another trip to France and tried to conquer. He always had this dream of being another Henry V and kind of conquering France and getting mm-hmm. that title back. But it was also, the relationship between England and France was so weird, going all the way back to 1066, because the French had conquered the Normans. And Normandy was different than France at this point. So just as there's, there were different kind of countries in England earlier Mm -hmm. and alfred the great and you know then after it kind of combined into england france had normandy and anjou and aquitaine and all of these places that were like their own sort of countries Mm -hmm. and in theory they were supposed to have bow to the king of france they were vassals but who knows so anyway you know the french invade england and then they have like the, the families then get so mixed up. Yeah. So probably everybody had a claim to everybody's throne at that point. Yeah. Um, after 500 years of all of this intermarrying and these families combining. And so Henry always kept that title. Okay. Yeah. Next, they, they showed a scene of like everyone, you know, them sort of rounding up. Yeah. People up there. Did they just like kill kind no. of? No. Like who they saw or? No. Okay. I don't know why they did. I mean, so it was really harsh, the, the penalties and the retributions. Mm-hmm. And, but really, only about 200 people were hung, were killed. Oh, okay. Jeez. I mean, the way it made it seem, it's like they just slaughtered right. the entire so there of were, the north. So I looked this up just to be sure, because I thought it looked kind of harsh. Yeah. And they, it was harsh the way they treated people. And, you know, they did punish people quite nice. a lot. Yeah. And yeah, it was hard to be a person up there then. Um, and there was a lot of suspicion and it lasted for a long time. But there were over 40,000 rebels officially mm-hmm. in the army and probably even more, but that's the official number, 40,000 and only 216 actual ex- executions. Okay. So you know, it wasn't like just pick people up off the street they didn't and just kill them. round up a whole town and kill men, women, and children. No. Okay. No. All right. Then we have the priest going in to talk to Robert Ask. And the question I had was he like pulled out, you know, he's like, how, you know, how do I don't know if I can trust you? And then the mm. guy pulled out the red cross and yeah. like kissed it. And that was the symbol of the rebels. And it, it, um, it was a flag that had, the hands and the feet, and it symbolized the wounds of Christ. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so that's the, what it was. And, and those people would have been like loyal to Catholicism? To Robert like, Ask and yeah, to the but rebellion. Loyal and, to the Pope. And yeah, stuff. to the Pope. Exactly. I guess that's what, okay. And like you told, like a good, uh, whatever, someone on the king's side would not pull out. No. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that was like the flag of the rebels. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> had to ask for, so. R- r- Ask had to, like, plead forgiveness for his family as well. Well, so this was always the hard thing about um, execution speeches. Uh Because everybody had to talk about how great the king was and how they were so deserving of death and how they were so sorry. And the king's justice was wonderful. Because if you know they, they could have only dreamed to be executed by in such, such a wonderful, a wonderful king. yes, and like Anne Boleyn's speech talked about how the king had been so good to her and such a loving lord and such a loving prince and blah 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 blah, and you had to do that because if you didn't, the king was going <clears> to <throat> hurt your family, and this so is what we up. see with Reginald Pole. That's so wrong. I mean, like, like Reginald Pole like, didn't give an execution speech, but no, he was I doing know, all this, and just, then his I family. Mean, like, at least you can, you know, curse out the dude who's killing you as you're being killed but no you can't even do that man. nope you can't even do that next we have sir francis uh speaking sir francis with brian king is that his name yeah okay sir francis brian he had a nickname called the vicar of hell wow good because that's he, a good one because he was licentious that's what they called him because he had quite an active love life mm-hmm funny and what also a, what because a nickname. I mean, that's a. Yeah. And also because he was um, played a pretty active role in Anne Boleyn's downfall, and he was Anne Boleyn's cousin. So he, like, just, that's he, what just, they... he just didn't didn't give much. No, he didn't. He's doing his thing. Yep. All right. So 
he did he really go to France? Do we know if if that was like a thing? Or so he went with... I don't know the, all of the specific movements. Okay, but the quest to get Reginald Pole was a huge part of the late 1530s. I see. They so, so, wanted him. So many bad. many things were were yes. are are likely in this search for and Reginald. And Francis Pole. Bryan was a spy. He had a history of being a diplomat and a spy. And so also that part of his life is kind of shady because he was a spy. He's a spy. Yeah, but you don't have um, accurate yeah. documentation. Yeah. So he would have gone on on trips like this and, you know, he he was friends with Henry and he would have been part of these kinds of actions. He was also friends with Cromwell at this point. And that was actually, when you read the Wolf Hall series, um, the, the inability to get Reginald Pole was one of the main things that Henry was mad at Cromwell for because Cromwell was never able to catch him. There were times mm -hmm. when they were so close. They were like within hours of being able mm -hmm. to get him. And they never, and, you know, he was just free to roam about Europe taking, taking comfort and catholic monarchs Anywhere. whose interest yeah. was to have england not be doing well you know mm -hmm. it was in their it was in france's interest for him to keep publishing these things yep. and so yeah they they chased him all over europe and they never were able to get him um and wow. yeah so there was a big hunt for reginald Cole. yeah and then in the in their talk with mm -hmm. the king and, and francis uh he said, you know, and, and find Pole and bring him to Calais. Like, yeah. What, that was the piece of land in France that England still owned. Oh, so that it's was like the last... Gibraltar exactly. is now in, in Quetta. Yeah. Okay. I think Quetta is owned by Spain, but yeah. No, that's what I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, But yeah. it's like a little enclave mm -hmm. of Spain sticking exactly. out of the Morocco. And it was the last little piece of France at one point under Henry V. Uh, after Agincourt, mm -hmm. you know, you see the map and England owned like all of France. Mm -hmm. And after Henry VI and England's civil wars and the Wars of the Roses and stuff, it was down to just this little port of Calais. Yeah. Um, and then Mary Tudor lost that herself. Way to go, Mary. I know. She said on her deathbed that after they took out her heart, they would find Calais on it because uh. she felt so terrible about having lost it. Um. But anyway, that was that was that. So that's why I wanted him sent to Calais. Okay. Then they were talking about Crom. Oh, and then I guess it was Jane talking about Cromwell, like being the richest man yeah. in England. Like, was that? He was, was making a like, lot of money. Yeah. He was making a lot. And to be fair, I mean, this kind of thing was expected from mm -hmm. royal. I mean, it was even like it, it augmented their salary. Mm -hmm. And it also, people thought that if you let people take tips like that, kind of like even now with tips of waitresses and stuff, that mm -hmm. they'll give better service, mm -hmm. that they'll be more loyal to the crown and they'll do better and they'll have, you know, that their, mm. their work will be better if they know they're getting a cut of everything, yeah. like a commission. Yeah, right? makes sense. Um, but it was one of the reasons why Cromwell had such a big downfall. I think there was a lot of like class issues because he was you know, not noble. And suddenly he was pretty much one of the richest people yeah, in England. England. And if you also had a certain amount of loyalty to the monasteries and to the places that he was pulling down, it's like, look at this man getting so rich off, yeah. of, off of monks. And he saw it as actually generating more wealth for the crown, you know, because the crown would take these lands that were owned by monasteries. Mm -hmm. The church was the largest landholder in England yeah. before the Reformation. And, like, had more land than the king. And it was all just consolidated under the Catholic Church. Like, the Pope owned most of England, you know, before. And so Cromwell takes this land and gives it to the king and says, look, you can sell it off to people. And so he sold it off to, you know, big families. And then he would take a cut of it. And so, or he would take a bribe, like, let's say that the Duke of Norfolk wants to buy this particular land okay, well, Cromwell, can I buy it? Here's like a little kickback for you. And so Cromwell saw it as like generating a lot of money for the crown and Henry was really happy with it, but his enemies were like, look at how he's getting rich look off of this. how bad it is. Yeah. What was his title? He had a number of titles. He had a lot of titles, but the one that I think they were talking about there was the Lord Privy Seal. Okay. And he had the seal, like the, yep. the important seal for all the documents and stuff. And do we know if the consulate met with, with Francis? Yeah, they would have done all of that. I mean, there, like I said, there was a big manhunt to get him. Everybody, 
everybody okay. was meeting everybody trying yeah. to trying to play this game to to get him. And do we know anything about the letter that the King again? Of France... There were lots of letters I going see. back so and it, forth. There was. It was is... like, please send me poll. Oh, I just had him. Oh no, talk yeah. to this guy. Maybe next Tuesday. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um. And yeah, they never found poll. Okay. And then next, we're talking about. Mary and Don Luis. Yeah. So Don, I mean, there were, again, Mary had a lot of different betrothals throughout her life. Yeah, suggested. And, and, and it, it's, again, part of my soft spot for Mary because she never actually got married. And I said this last time. Um, and this was at a period where she was, again, being recognized by her mm -hmm. father. And so they would have had more marriage proposals at that point. So yeah. there, there were some proposals coming in but then pretty soon you know she'd be declared a bastard again or you know whatever she'd go for after edward was born then she's down the line one more and you know it was always hard to have mary's status be stable long enough to actually have get to be a marriage yeah yeah all right and then uh Chapuy and mary had like a conversation yeah. And not that we would know that that conversation happened or whatever, but but would they speak sometimes? Yeah, like... they were really, really close to each other. Oh, okay. I mean, because Chapuis had been close to Catherine, yeah. and so Mary kind of saw him as this surrogate kind of And I'm sure he person. kind of felt... You really know, protective of her. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were very close. All right. That's, that's nice. And then we have the scene where the king is criticizing... Priests. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. What? What's? Was that a? Was that a thing? Do we know? I yeah. Mean... So again, in this period, fifteen thirty six or fifteen thirty seven, um, Hen so Henry, it was like these waves where he, there wasn't any such thing as Protestant Protestantism at this point. There wasn't people weren't called Protestants. They were called Evangelicals, mm -hmm. and there was these rising periods where he was super into the Evangelical faith. And then, like, something would change, like, when he was married to Jane Seymour, who was more conservative, and, like, her family then and had his ear. And so then he kind of back yeah. off. And there was, like, this back and forth. By 1540, he had actually published the Bible in England and in English, which William Tyndale had died for that just a couple of years earlier. And he actually used much of Tyndale's translation, which is kind of ironic. But, you know, the, the frontispiece of the Great Bible shows Henry VIII giving shows god giving henry the eighth the bible and it's a beautiful frontispiece it's it's done by holbein it was this uh woodcut and then henry's giving it to both cranmer and cromwell and then they're distributing it cromwell's distributing it to all of the secular people and mm. cranmer's distributing it to all of the all of the churches mm. and they he had this rule that every church needed to have a bible in english that everybody could read that was available for everybody. And this is where you start to see the rise in literacy that I think is so interesting during this period. There's, there's this huge push for education for women and, and children of all classes so that they could read the Bible. And it's such an interesting period, um, and I'm getting sidetracked. So, but that was in 1540, 1539, 1540. 1537, he was back in a Catholic phase. So he was angry at the rise in the evangelical beliefs. And so he was kind of given Catholics some more but credence. It's like, you did this. I, dude. Well, I know. Like... And so then Anyways, by, by 1539, uh -huh. he had published the Great Bible, 1540. But then, of course, Cromwell is on the outs and Cromwell gets killed. And then you start S to. Spoiler see, alert. Right. And then you start to see a rise in people like Stephen Gardner, who were more conservative. And, you know, the, then there's a, a bigger rise of the Catholic. And it wasn't until Elizabeth, it was one of the first things she did. And when we watched the movie, Elizabeth, I think you and I watched it for that, um, that podcast we did beyond the big screen. Um, and so it was one of the first things she did was gather everybody together and say, look, we're going to solve this. And we're going to have the Church of England because it went Protestant under Edward, yeah. super, super Protestant, mm -hmm. and then super, super, super Catholic, Catholic under Mary. Mary. And then Elizabeth's there, and you know she still loved all of the tradition, all of the music, all of the stuff like yep. that, the liturgy. But she also knew that there was, you know, even jealous. She wanted people to be able to read the Bible, and she wanted the Bible in English, and all this kind of stuff. So Not she to said, pay all her money to the Pope." Exactly. So mm -hmm. she said, "Look, we've got to have this compromise," and that was the great compromise that Elizabeth did in like 1563, I believe. And um, so yeah, that's what's so, going on so here. So Henry was <clears throat> extremely internally. Uh, conflicted with this. Well, you story. know, I think it's really interesting because there was a period in his, the last year of his reign 
where I think within the span of just a couple of days, he executed one side of people for being too Catholic, for being um, heretics who supported the Pope. And then the next day, there was a, an execution of somebody who was a heretic for being too Protestant. Being too Protestant. Like, he couldn't... He couldn't make up his he mind. Wanted, he really wanted to be Catholic, but have himself be in charge. Like, yeah. he, just, he wanted just wanted to be to the be Pope. Ca- yeah, he wanted to be the Pope. And exactly. the king, and because God chose him. Right. And he thought it would be a good idea for people to be able to read the Bible. Sometimes. Yeah. Other times he didn't think that. I'm, I'm, I'm with that. I'm, I'm with that part. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the, the, that they can. Yeah. All right. Oh, and then I, I, this little, like, how much did he help shape the church? I mean, like, like yeah. hands on other than just telling people. do. No, like he was that. super. And that's the thing, you know, there's this whole story that he was raised to be in the church before he, cause yeah. he was the second son. Yeah. Now, a lot of historians have debunked some of that and said, no, he wasn't officially raised to be in the church. There's still this idea that he was raised. Either way, he was really into the theological arguments, and he loved having theological arguments. And when people even were put in jail for their beliefs, he would actually go and want to debate them and say, let's talk about this, because he was really, really well-versed in all this. He was yeah. really smart about like all the different quotations. He was like really into it. Um, he was like super spiritual in that way, um, where he knew everything yep. and he, he loved talking about it and he loved thinking about it. Um, so he was really involved in wanting to shape a lot of this kind of stuff. And so I think you could say that he was involved from that perspective, but also just the lasting legacy of this whiplash. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And then the Seymours, they're talking with the King again, like they are not fans of Trump. This is just a religious thing, or well, they were early because he helped to bring Jay- he helped to bring Anne down. Uh-huh. So they they were fans of him in the get go um, initially. Then they stopped being fans of him because they didn't like the religious thing and him making so much money off of the mm-hmm. monasteries and all of that. So it's more like they were now aligned with the king, and, and they like they thought that he should have owed them more, kind of, you know, because. He, they each had this idea that the other side should have owed them more. Because he's like, look, I he's made like, your sister yeah, queen. I let and, you in, so you need to help me out. And they're yeah. like, look, we're the most important people. We could bring you down. You should be good to us. And so there was this back and forth kind of, of, of it. Tension. Yeah. Okay. And then the king, in, in that conversation, I sort of, you know, he kind of says, like, the king does, like, blame Cromwell for all of this going wrong, mm-hmm. but he can't. Like, if he blamed him publicly, then it would yeah. make the king look bad. Yeah. So he kind of couldn't, yeah. he kind of just I, had to write it out. Henry, Henry mm-hmm. always had this kind of, uh, towards the end, had a, a difficult relationship with Cromwell like that. There were periods where Cromwell was super high up in favor and then not. And it, Cromwell always managed to come back. But yeah, they, they didn't like each other some of the time. Okay. Yeah. And then Lady Lyle had her daughters in court. That's what we talked about last time with the quail eggs that she sent to mm-hmm. um, try and ingratiate to have a place for her daughter. Yeah. And it's, they bring it up because it's one of the few, and they talk about the dresses they're going to need yep. and stuff like they that. They said they needed a satin and a damask dress. Exactly. And it's one of the few um, kind of direct letters that we have that show the way this kind of thing worked and also that showed what, what this kind of thing? like how you got places at court and just um, the politics of it and from the women's perspective and from mm-hmm. the queen's perspective and also like what what a woman would have needed to go to court because it, it's laid out the inventory of everything she should bring and th- there aren't really that many letters that that show this i think that's like the only one from this period that shows what you know what women needed to have to bring to court and also just how the process worked of of bring her and it's just a funny story because Jane said she would take them both and then whoever was the prettiest she would keep or something like that and it it was just it's just kind of um one of the few direct pieces of evidence. of evidence yeah. of of what of that and do you have any idea the the why satin and damask like is was it just that that was just what they needed okay um yeah i don't know the reasoning behind it but that was just it there's this inventory of everything they're supposed to mm-hmm. have brought that was included cool all right yeah. um and then my last question where i will leave you off is uh did jane have a long labor 
So she did have a long labor. She had a two and a half day labor. Okay, yeah, I would classify that as long. Well, she went into, even longer, she went into labor on the 9th of October, on the afternoon of the 9th, and then her son was born at 2 a.m. on the 12th. So, yeah, like two and a half days. Um, and the thing about, I know you're going to start to cry, but... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, I, I, I was just going to, I was just going to leave. <laughs> Oh, God. So, so okay. everyone doesn't have to hear me cry. <laughs> so the thing about the that was different. So Alison Weir actually did some new research in her book, um, the historical fiction series she's doing on the Six Wives. And I interviewed her about Jane Seymour and her new theories about Jane's death. The fact was that Jane was up writing letters about the birth, signing the birth announcements. There was no sign that she was unwell until the 16th. So there were four days in there where she was actually doing really well and nobody had said anything that, that she wasn't well. But then she started, they, they start talking about um, a natural lax. That's where the word laxative comes from. So Jane had a lot going on there with her stomach. And there's actually this theory now that she didn't die of childbed fever that she died of something going on with her stomach. Um, and it was probably related because her body wasn't 100% well enough to, to handle, to recover, because she was tired from the labor and she was exhausted. And, you know, you need to heal from that. Um, and she couldn't fend it off. But so the idea is that she, she didn't actually die of childbed fever, but it was more like dysentery or something related to her stomach. Um, so that is the idea. And if you want to learn more about that, I interviewed Allison Weir um, on my show. So you can just look for whatever episode. It was a couple of years ago, 2018, I think. Um, you can look for that episode on my podcast um, where Allison Weir talks about her theory of Jane's, what she died of. And yeah, that's that story. All right, I'm done. All right. Thank you for listening. Are you, are you all right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you people for listening. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad you're alive. All right. Thank you. Me too. Um, and we'll be back again with, uh, nobody else I don't think dies in childbirth. So, okay. all right. Um, and yeah, TudorCon, if you are interested in coming to that and yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, we'll thank be you back. guys. We'll, we'll see you or hear you next time. Happy 2021. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.